There's a documentary about Warp Tour. You remember Warp Tour. It follows a group of artists who are scheduled to play on the 2010 dates across the country. Every storyline in that documentary is interesting, but even when it's following a band like Suicide Silence or Never Shout Never, I'm still wishing it would cut back to the underdog plotline in that film. Because the documentary No Room for Rockstars doesn't just follow bands who are scheduled to play. It follows a band who wasn't scheduled to play. And that band was Forever Came Calling. An unknown group of guys in an unknown punk rock outfit followed Warp Tour 2010 in their van, trying to sell enough CDs to pay for gas and get them to the next stop. The story of Forever Came Calling is a story about paving your own way. It's about the good breaks and the bad breaks. About putting yourself out there for the entire world to see. Forever Came Calling has been laughed at, disrespected, and stereotyped. But in their journey across the country that year in 2010, they showed more courage than anyone else in that tour. The band members of Forever Came Calling would go up to people in line with a stack of CDs, a CD player, and some headphones and ask them to check out their band. Hopefully if they liked the CD, they could convince them to buy a copy, and that money would help pay for gas to get them to the next tour. That technique would help spread the word about Forever Came Calling and get their name out there a little bit, but nothing would be more satisfying than watching Forever Came Calling get their big break in the form of a tiny break when Kevin Lyman would let them play a tiny set on one of the stops on the Warp Tour. Watching the band score a win like that and seeing how happy it made them to be able to play in front of people would have been a heartwarming enough story on its own, even if Forever Came Calling had never gone on to do anything else afterwards. But that wouldn't be the last that we heard of Forever Came Calling. The documentary would be a catalyst to get their name out even further, and Forever Came Calling would go on to have a pretty beloved career in the pop punk scene. Not to discredit anyone who's ever been a part of Forever Came Calling, but the one constant through all of the lineup changes and history of the band has been the vocalist Joe Candelaria. Or Candelaria. I started the band when I was 17 with my friends Tim Lemos and Gabe Sanchez. We kept going through members and I kept the name because it always was me writing the songs and people would come and go. A huge break for the band at the time was signing to Pure Noise Records. And eventually Forever Came Calling's very first full length would come out of that partnership. But it was a demo of the song The Office that would convince people that Forever Came Calling didn't suck. According to Joe, that's the song that got Forever Came Calling signed to Pure Noise Records. And yes, it is indeed named after the TV show. Joe was 22 when he wrote the song, and it's about being in a relationship that's too good to be true. He would attribute the song's success to the lyrics, specifically the jarring line, I'll kill myself to shock my friends. Even beyond the lyrics, it's a three minute song that just refuses to let up. It's got a lot of parts in it and a killer outro. I think the song was just destined to be a hit, but really, it didn't start out that way. The band showed up to recording sessions with producer Sam Pura, who at the time was just starting to get his big break and was recording with the likes of The Story So Far, and he has continued to record with The Story So Far since. But Forever Came Calling showed up to the recording sessions thinking that they had the songs pretty much all wrote and had delusions of how easy the recording process was going to be. But after showing Sam the demos, he would say that he would have rather Forever Came Calling showed up with nothing. Hearing that was a big hit to the band's egos, but they would learn a lot from that experience. Joe would learn to let go and allow other people to try and improve on his ideas. And what they ended up changing through Sam's input and other people's creative input allowed them to make a bunch of really great songs. The record was supposed to be called Only Connecting. I was a big Jack's Mannequin fan. It felt very Jack's Mannequin. I was like, it's gotta mean something. Once I got over that idea, I wrote the line, Contender for Everything. I really liked the idea of a simple record name. A one word record name was what I wanted. I felt like Contender was really where the band was at. We were young and scrappy and weren't supposed to win. But every time you put us up against somebody, it's like, what the fuck, this band is good. And it's like, yeah, we're good, we're a band. And the advice from Sam combined with the hard work of Forever Came Calling would pay off. Contender would be extremely well received and it still is a beloved album. Joe would mention how shocked that he was when he learned that the album was only 24 minutes long. He'd be like, my life's work is only 24 minutes. And he would be a little embarrassed about that. But I think the length of the album is honestly one of its strengths. It never wears out its welcome 
and it flies by at a blistering and breakneck speed, leaving you wanting more by the time it's done. And personally, I consider Contender to be a pop punk classic. Forever Came Calling just celebrated 10 years of Contender, and they went on a nationwide tour supporting that, but more on that later. Contender would be a hit critically in the scene and would allow Forever Came Calling to go on some headlining tours as well as be support acts for some really big and cool bands. But as I say time and time again, there is no money in this scene, even for the most successful bands. And Forever Came Calling would point this out in their next record, What Matters Most. If Contender was such a hit, at least with the critics and hipster elitists, tell me why I can't pay my rent. Even though the reception of Contender was great, all was not well behind the scenes. Forever Came Calling was being told, even by their own label, that they didn't really look like a band. Joe doesn't specify who would say this, but he would mention that they were being called the Fat Brown Band. And it's crazy to look back and realize how important it was to the label, the look of a band. I mean, the same thing would happen to a band called Valencia, where Shane Henderson would essentially starve himself to look the part. So despite all of the hours on the road, the mild success of the album, and everything that Forever Came Calling had achieved to that point, they would still become disillusioned and disenchanted with the music industry. They would not reunite with Sam Pura for the second record. Instead, they would record their follow-up, What Matters Most, with Kyle Black, who has worked with bands like Seaway and Broadside, and the album would release in 2014 to less critical acclaim. This album wouldn't be nearly as well received. People would say that it sounds like Contender 2, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, but I will admit that this album doesn't quite capture the magic that Contender had, although it does have some really great songs on it, like Indebted and Rather Be Dead Than Cool and Mapping with a Sense of Direction. It definitely wasn't the next big step for the band. It felt like they were crab walking, if anything. But Joe would say that for this album, what matters most, he would try and set aside any fears that he had or embarrassments of saying what he felt and just go for it. And I think you can tell that in this album, especially with some of the more meta lyrics on this record that Joe belts out. They would still tour this album and be going on cool tours, but family emergencies would force the band to take a step back from Forever Came Calling, and they would essentially be on hold and on hiatus as a band. Hanging up the towel would be a shock for them, especially for Joe, he would say. I derived all of my worth from the band. So when there was no band, it was like, whoa, who the fuck am I? A big part of the thing was like, that was my identity for over half my life. You know, this is what I do. This is what I tell people. This is how I contribute to the world. And then when I didn't have that anymore, I was like, fuck, this is crazy. They would have a false return with the EP Retro Future, which would release on an Australian label. And I'm going to skip over this EP because I don't think it's very good. And even Joe himself questions the place and the headspace he was in when he wrote that album. So I think it's fair to say that we can just pretend like this EP maybe didn't happen and move on to the more present day, specifically the 10 year anniversary of Contender. Forever Came Calling was only planning on doing a single show in California to celebrate the 10-year release, but when their manager booked it, he ended up getting calls from a bunch of other places that were asking if, if they wanted to celebrate at this venue or this venue, and eventually that turned into putting together a full tour across the country. And the coolest thing for me was they kicked off the tour with a secret show with some of the local bands here in Tucson, literally right across the street from me. I love the idea that Forever Came Calling underestimated just how excited people would be to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of this album right here. Like they were maybe hoping to sell out the California show, but couldn't have imagined that it would have turned into an entire tour that people would show up to and go crazy over. But I think it goes to show one, how important this band is to a lot of people, but two, the headspace that Forever Came Calling is in now, that they're even willing to go on that tour shows how dedicated they are to the band. And that is backed up by Joe himself. He would say, I'm more dedicated to the band than I've ever been, which is weird. It's weird. I used to get so upset and be like, we've got to be perfect and tight, but I would always feel like we'd fuck up. And now I'm more dedicated, meaning I'm more intentional. So it's just like, no, I know what I have to do. I know what I'm here to do, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability that night. What that is, we'll both see. It's cool to have that confidence and know that I know how to fucking do this. I'm not here by dumb luck. I know that now. I think I didn't know that before. So it sounds like Joe's in a great spot. The band has a couple of new members, at least as touring musicians. 
they repressed Contender on vinyl with some new album artwork and even revisited some of the songs on it. The 10 year anniversary tour is over, but this is not the end of Forever Came Calling. They say that they are working on a new record and it's going to be called Other Desert Cities. Even if that new record isn't well received, I think Forever Came Calling have cemented themselves at least as hometown favorites and doing what they did on Warp Tour was definitely a huge step in the right direction for them and kick-started their careers. And I love that it was included as a part of this documentary called No Room for Rock Stars. Make sure to check that out if you haven't before. I will always think of Forever Came Calling as the band who persisted through everything and managed to grasp success, even if for a little bit. I find the story of how they started very inspiring, and I hope to find the story of how they finish up even more inspiring. Until then, I wish the best for the band. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in another video right here.